Uh, I'm Gretchen Jordan, and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I joined CSRF uh, as a volunteer back in the summer of 2023. And then uh, about six months later, I became the associate director uh, of the foundation to help out Leslie and all the other fun things that happen with a nonprofit. Um, it's been an exciting journey, um, and it all kind of came about from being a patient myself of Cushing's disease, uh, diagnosed in 2020, and and realizing that that patient journey is not a fun thing at all. And I thought, what better way to now serve a fulfilling purpose and try to help others that are going through that journey uh, and hopefully try to make it a little easier. Hi, my name is Leslie Edwin. I was diagnosed in 2012 with Cushing's disease. Um, so I started volunteering with CSRF in 2014. And then in early 2018, I became its president. So uh, I've been with the organization for about a decade now. So my journey was a little different. Uh, many aspects of it have been, but uh, I did not suspect something was really wrong and, and try and try for years like most people have to. Um, I just waited till I was really bad off. Um, I ignored a lot of the oncoming symptoms because in the beginning, a lot of them would go away for about three years before my actual diagnosis. I would have bouts for about six weeks of just sudden really bad acne, for example. But then again, after about six weeks, right when I was about to do something about it, uh, it would just sort of go away. So, um, you know, a few years of that, just sort of like, all right, something's happening. Maybe it's because I'm a woman, maybe because I'm getting older. I was in my early 30s. I just had a baby um, and we were moving. Maybe it was stress. Like, who knows? You know, there were so many things it could have been. It's very easy to ignore. Um, also, the slow but steady weight gain didn't probably notice at first until things stopped really fitting. Um, but I really did gain a lot of weight. It was, it was slow and steady for a long time. So by the time I, by the time my second surgery, that's a little preview there. Um, I weighed 365 pounds. Um, so it just kept coming on no matter what, but, um, ultimately in 2012, I had a, a run in with a friend who had just been, uh, diagnosed with a thyroid disorder. And she had a friend who had just been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And she saw me after a long time of not seeing me and pretty immediately just said, you've got, you got something going on. You got to go to your gynecologist and get some testing. Cause she was just sure it was, you know, thyroid or PCOS. And so, uh, April of 2014, I'm sorry, April, 2012, I went to the gynecologist. She did a full hormone panel, which I don't know if they all do, but that was kind of my saving grace. Um, she said, it's not PCOS. It's something pointing to the brain, referred me to an endocrinologist um, who we would just call like a local endo, who's not a, a Cushing specialist. He did two tests. So he did two urine, uh, 24 hour urine tests, which I'm sure we'll get into that in a minute, but, um, and they were just so sky high. He was like, this is just out of my, this is out of my pay grade essentially. And so he referred me to a specialist center, uh, Emory at the time had a pituitary center here in Atlanta. And so I went there and just had more testing and ultimately had my first surgery, December of 2012. So for me, the testing took longer really than the time I really knew something was wrong. Um, I think it's a lot faster these days. This is a dozen years ago, but, um, my first surgery was not well. Uh, the second surgery, ultimately my pituitary gland was removed, but my cortisol was still high. And that just started a, a complicated after period. My journey started from what I can recall, the symptoms first coming on was probably about 2018, uh, 2017, I had a hip replaced and that caused a lot of pain and, and issues. So I was feeling great after that resolved. And so I thought life was good um, until I started paying attention to a little bit more, um, you know, approaching the age of 40, it was kind of my hair is starting to fall out and just growing, you know, some chin hair and gaining weight slowly, um, started realizing there was differences in my job. Um, I wasn't as sharp as I used to be, and I couldn't remember a lot of details, uh, that I was supposed to. And, and that felt a really odd, but I thought, again, if this is what 40 is going to be like, this is not fun, <laughs> but you just, you know, especially as a woman, you just chalk it up to, hormones and changes in life and you push through um 
And I've always been kind of a night owl, but I started staying up later and later every night. Um, I would get caught up in the whole Netflix and, uh, you know, watching shows throughout the night, all of a sudden it'd be 530 in the morning and I wasn't tired. And yet, you know, I still would push through the job the next day. And once that started coming on, you know, after weeks and being months, I thought this is kind of a little odd. It was kind of fun because I wasn't tired, but <laughs> then you kind of crash a little bit. Um, the, I think what started being more precise or more uh, diagnostic was my husband would start to notice things. Uh, my face was really red. Um, he looks like it, he thought I just wanted to start a fight all the time with anybody I was talking to, um, which wasn't true. Like, I, you know, I, I felt on edge, um, but for him to point that out was, was noticeable. Um, uh, but it got so stressful at work that it was almost time to just quit my job. And so we had a lot of discussion in, the, in our family and just try to figure out how financially we can make it happen. Um, cause it just, it didn't feel healthy to me anymore. Um, so I quit that and then, uh, we had a couple rental properties and we purchased another one and I was just doing renovations. That was the summer of 2020. So right when COVID hit, doing a lot of work myself and I, I used to be able to, you know, work a power drill and do the kind of construction, small projects and things. And that's when I really noticed a lot of change. I was getting lightheaded and nauseous in the mornings, um, really shaky. So like I would my physical capabilities would just drop extremely really fast. Um, I'd try to measure something and I'd turn around and write down the numbers and I couldn't remember them. <laughs> I thought, okay, this, this really sucks. Um, and it happened to be that a couple months later, it was my annual physical and I went to the doctor and I really was cognizant about all of this nonspecific symptoms that I've been feeling to try to tell her everything I could think of. Cause you know, it, it's not one particular thing that becomes a problem. Um, and I'd seen other specialists, you know, and among this journey as well, but <clears throat> I told her I wanted to test my cortisol because I just felt stressed out. And I don't think a lot of people ask for that. Um, and I feel like I was lucky in that because the result of that was extremely high above a normal high reading. Um, and not a lot of people get that. So I think it just, I was thankful that the lab was just spot on and, and it showed an anomaly. So she sent me into an endocrinologist and within a month, I believe, um, we determined, uh, you know, through the urinary tests, uh, dexamethasone suppression test at night, uh, finally an MRI showed the pituitary tumor. And within two weeks I was sent into surgery. Uh, I still didn't know what Cushing's was. Um, and in hindsight, um, you know, if, if, as we talk about this, it not having the knowledge and then realizing how maybe not communicative physicians and surgeons are about it all, because they maybe see it a little bit more often. Um, it, it's really important now to, for me to, to prep other patients and, and let them know just expectations because surgery is only the first step of, of the healing process. From, from one angle, if you don't, if you have high cortisol, but on a test, but you don't have Cushing's, it's important to get the right diagnosis because if you're with a doctor that misinterprets how the guidelines are written or, or something and just thinks that some high tests are indicative of a, of a disease or, a, or a, of an ongoing syndrome rather than a spot, a moment in time where your natural cortisol is rising to mitigate something that's going on, or perhaps you're taking uh, an inhaled corticosteroid for asthma or allergies, or you're getting shots for pain in your joints. These don't really make a correlation that that's a steroid. And a lot of steroid over time can give you Cushing syndrome, um, but it's, a, it's an exogenous type. It's not caused by a tumor. And so the, the process is different. It's not a surgery to remove something from inside your body, but we have unfortunately heard of, of many people going for surgeries that they didn't need when they were diagnosed improperly by a doctor that didn't really know what they were doing. Um, so that's one angle of it. But then the other angle is to get, it's so important to get a proper diagnosis if you do have, uh, especially endogenous Cushing's. Exogenous, uncontrolled can have the same types of long-term negative effects, but endogenous, meaning you've got a tumor, 
either on your pituitary gland, your adrenal gland, maybe both adrenal glands, maybe both pituitary and adrenal. That's super rare, or possibly even on your lung, on your pancreas. Um, there's there's a couple of genetic causes, but if you've got this tumor, it's not going to just stop growing because you you found out what it was. It's going to keep growing. It can start pressing on the structures around it, um, and the cause in the case of like a pituitary gland, um, it could press on your optic nerve. It could press on some of your other hormone producing areas of the pituitary gland and cause problems with your hormone levels. So it's really important to get the correct diagnosis um, with blood work, scans, thorough you know history, uh, a real true Cushing's appointment with the right testing to figure out where is the culprit and to tackle it from the correct point of view. So that when you have your surgery, hopefully with a really great surgeon, which is another huge part of it, um, that you're, you'll, you will have a successful surgery. I mean, that's the you know, best case scenario. Connect with a patient advocacy organization like CSRF first because it's a collective or, or you know, one that you can identify as a collective of uh, heavily, heavily involved patients. Uh, there can be other people on the team, but you know, patients who have been through this, who are working to create the kinds of resources and educational materials that will be even more helpful because we all went through it with these limited kind of resources and odd things being told to us that didn't end up being true. And then like the, the volumes of things that we wish we had known. Um, so if a patient can connect with a group and get real true, and I'm not talking about like a Facebook group, <laughs> unless it's been vetted somehow, which I don't, I don't know if those exist quite yet, but, and there's good people in, in the Facebook groups, but you're gonna get kind of like a, a wandering story that doesn't really, doesn't really fit and doesn't get you to a successful uh, understanding of what's going on and what to do next. So I wish that I had had that before my surgery um, I wish I'd come across it like a year before I was diagnosed because I just would have connected with a lot of things that were happening. I just hid them all, <laughs> um, you know, gaining weight. I didn't want to talk about it. The acne, I was like, you know, I don't want to talk about that because it was like ugly things and just wanted to suffer in silence. But if I had come across, you know, this list of, of symptoms, I probably would have, uh, probably pursued something. I didn't know anything about cortisol. That just wasn't even on my radar. Um, Gretchen mentioned that she, was stressed and she knew the connection to the cortisol. I didn't even, I mean, getting the diagnosis was the first time I ever really considered cortisol. I figure it's a spectrum. There's people, you know, they somehow know about it because they're into sports medicines and things. And there's people who have no clue about what that even was. I echo all of that too. And I wish I'd known about CSRF. I'd wish I'd known about other resources. I even asked my endocrinologist when I was diagnosed, I said, is there any reading material or anything that you can give me to to learn about this, you know, and he's like, no, there's nothing really out there. Um, you know, there might be some Facebook groups <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> in hindsight. I just thought, how do we get that education out to the doctors, you know, that we are here? Um, you know, we've, we've got patient support calls and we get 25 people on there that are all parts of their, their journey. And they, they found it and they're learning about it because they got that diagnosis and they're just hungry for all of the different experiences because everybody has gone through something completely different. And, and it's so good to have all that information to know what are the right questions to ask your doctor as you're going through this is a big one that we get. Um, even the right questions to ask your surgeon, um, cause there's, you know, there's best practices that are out there and, you know, just being able to get the information into their hands is, is, is pretty gold. And even what to expect going into surgery. Like I've, I've been able to, I don't know, I felt very emotional the first time I was talking to somebody, this is like a decade ago. They're like, I'm about to go to surgery. I'm really freaking out. And I was like, all right, do you get hot at night? Like bring a, bring a fan, you know, like bring a bigger towel because a hospital towel is never going to be big enough. These, all these things that I realized when I was in the hospital, they would just made me more comfortable instead of just feeling like a specimen up on a table or whatever, you know, uncomfortable, cold at the wrong time, hot at the wrong time, just if you bring some of the necessities and my doctor didn't say that, Hey, bring a care bag. You know, that's something that a patient would be like, Oh my God, this is top. You know, you need to do this if you're going to be there for more than probably two or three days. Mm -hmm.